one said, failure defeats losers, but failure inspires winners. I'm here to tell you about my failures and how it inspired a winner. My name is Cornell Sims. I'm the founder and owner of Digital Health LLC. I'm a speaker, author, and a consultant. I also run a nonprofit organization and is geared towards redeveloping land in the community that I want to destroy. And I'm also a partnership in a prison consulting company based out of Georgia. My failures, I was raised and born in an impoverished neighborhood. My mom was on drugs, father wasn't nowhere in the picture. And I can see on y'all face like, what does this have to do with this? Well, I'm gonna get to it. <laughs> So I was raised in this environment, and I learned how to hustle at an early age. But I adapted the mindset that I was a product of my environment, and I carried that mindset as a chip on my shoulder. So with that mindset, by the time I was a teenager, I found myself inside of juveniles and foster homes. And while I was in foster home, I worked on playing basketball, as you can tell from my height. I, I had played some kind of sports. <laughs> so I became good at playing basketball, and it took me to college. And while in college, I still had that same attitude, that same mentality, that I was a product of my environment. So I wasn't doing the average things that the student athlete should be doing. I was engaged in other activities. And so once my college career was over, I found myself back at home, back into the same environment that I grew up in, and I was selling drugs. So I got caught selling drugs, not one time, but twice. Obviously I wasn't that good at it if I kept getting caught. <laughs> so I got caught and I got sentenced to 19 years in the Missouri Department of Corrections. So when I entered the Missouri Department of Corrections, I had the same mentality, same attitude, and all I did was play basketball while I was locked up in the Missouri Department of Corrections. Besides playing basketball, I just sit back with everybody, and we didn't talk about nothing. What we did on the streets, who had the most money, who had the flyest car, and all that. And then the Senate bill was passed that cut my time in half, and I was up for release. I was ready to be out, but I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. So after doing the five and a half years in Missouri Department of Correction, I was released. And I was released into the same environment, back around the same people, and I had the same mindset. So what happened? I sold the same drugs. I came back at it again. I already failed twice, and here I am again. 44% of the people that get released from prison within one year get rearrested, reoffended. And I fell right into that statistic. Within one year, I was rearrested for selling drugs again. I wasn't that good, I just wasn't good. So I was rearrested and I found myself sitting in the county jail and I beat the drug case on a technicality. And I know somebody else said, man, you just get, catch a break, catch a break. And I was catching breaks, but the problem was I still had the same mentality. So when I beat the case on the technicality, I went right back doing the same thing. And we all know that's insanity. You keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results like you something different. So two, two to three years went by and I didn't get caught. So I'm thinking, oh, I'm doing it right now. Then the federal government came and picked me up. They took me to the Western District of Missouri in Kansas City to the Charles Whitaker Federal Courthouse and they handed me a piece of paper. It had my name versus the United States of America. Federal drug and conspiracy charges, gang activity. And when I seen that paper, with my name versus the United States of America, I told myself right then and there, something had to change. Because I am the first victim of my own actions. Not the only victim, but the first victim of my own actions. And that mentality, that mind state that I was carrying, I had to change it as well. So I started reading. I started
started educating myself. I changed my whole attitude. I started studying business law, business management, knowledge of self, seed and soul, super rich, rich dad, poor dad, contagious, all business book, and working on myself book. And I took all my pictures from the streets on my wall and built a vision board of what I wanted my life to be like once I got released. And in my lowest times in prison, I found myself helping people on the outside and on the inside, helping them set a vision for themselves and helping them set goals for themselves. And I found out that this was my gift, helping people. And one guy helped me particularly when I got through helping him in that uh, and I painted the picture so vivid to him and the steps so vivid, he said, man, you're a visionary hustler. I took that word and I said, that's going to be the name of my company. I wrote it down on a piece of paper and I started building what I wanted my company to be like once I was released from prison from that point on. That's how I came up with the name Visionary Hustler. When I was released from prison, I had four legal folders full of plans, goals, ideas, and everything I was going to do. And once I was released, I knew that if I was going to help people, I needed to be more educated. So I enrolled in the life coaching program. I got my first life coaching diploma within six months, but I continued it for a whole other year and became a master certified empowerment life coach. As soon as I became that, I started Visionary Hustle LLC. I started off speaking, and I started off coaching and consulting, and I began to expand, and I wrote a book. I got five books. The first book I wrote is called Have, The Keys to Success. A lot of y'all seen Have on there, and probably was wondering what is Have. These are my personal keys to success as I use personally and as I started getting into entrepreneurship. Hustle is the H. Attitude is the A. Vision is the B. Education is the E. Me personally, I had to have these keys to be successful. I had to utilize these keys and apply these keys to be successful. Am I saying these are the only keys it takes to be successful in entrepreneurship? No. But these are the keys that I use. So let's talk about the hustle. Abraham Lincoln said, things come to those that wait, but only the things that are left by those who hustle. Things come to those that wait, but only those things that are left by those who hustle. That's what Abraham Lincoln said. If you want your business to be successful, I invite you to discover how to hustle. When it comes to entrepreneurship and hustle, it's about getting your brand in front of people. It's about getting your service, your product in front of the people, in front of your target audience, in front of your customers, you have to hustle to do that. You're not going to be able to sit still and get your brain down. You got to go to networking events. You got to throw up shoulders. You got to get out in the public. Nobody's going to know your business if you're just sitting there. You have to take the steps. The biggest part of hustling to help build your company, old-fashioned word of mouth. Word of mouth is responsible for 20, 20 to 50 percent of business growth. Why? Because everybody talks. Today, social media, we all get on social media. We all on our phone. We're talking to our coworkers. We're talking to our family members. And we talk about problems. Did you know every hour, 100 million brands are in conversation? I mean, every hour, 100 conversations are being held about brands. Conversations, word of mouth, every hour. 100 million conversations 
are held without brand. And your average person shares on social media 16,000 words per day. How many people in here, somebody told them about this event? Raise your hand. Word of mouth. Think about the restaurants you eat at. Reviews. Word of mouth. Your sister might have ate at a good restaurant you never heard of. She calls you or she tags you in Facebook posts. Oh, I ate at this good restaurant yesterday. It was good. What's the name of it? Oh, it's such and such. Where's it at? Oh, it's down by the riverfront. Oh, really? I never heard of it. We should go there and eat next week. Word of mouth. That's the hustle. When you get out and network, you as an entrepreneur, business owner, you start the word of mouth by getting out, talking about your business. I moved to St. Joe a year ago. Nobody knew who I was. Nobody heard, ever heard of Biz Day Hustle LLC. But I hustled. Look where I'm at right now. I hustled. I got out with networking events. Met people in the chamber. Talked to people in the chamber about my business. They spread the word. That's hustle, word of mouth. In the streets, when I was in the streets, a successful drug dealer that makes money, makes money from word of mouth. If you have the best product that works just like this, if I have the best product on the street, an addict comes and buys my product, he goes back and tells another addict, Cordell got the best product. They go to another addict, Cordell got the best product. Somebody's looking for the product that don't know me, yeah, we need to go to Cornell. He got the best product. And in one day time, I can make $2,000 off word of mouth. That's how the word of mouth works. So you have to get your brand, you have to hustle your brand, your company, to the people so they can put it out there, word of mouth. That's the hustle side of it. Let's talk about the attitude. The attitude of your business, hustles, I'm telling you, hustles, I'm showing you how you can get your customers. Attitude is what's going to help you keep your customers. What's the attitude of your business? What or what attitude does your company or your business give off? How many people in here, by a show of hands, went into a place where the attitude of the business just wasn't up to par? He's like, I'm never going there again. A lot of times it happens in the food industry, customer service. If you're the owner of the business, your attitude trickles down the chain of command. It trickles down the chain of command. So if you have a bad attitude and you can put it down on your workers, the workers are going to carry that same attitude to the customers. The customers are going to take that same attitude to potential customers, word of mouth. It works for the good, it works for the bad. I went to Bogey over there, they got four services. When I was there, they did this to me last time. Word of mouth works the same way. So the attitude of your business, it was determined, is it gonna keep your customers? Are you gonna be able to keep your customers? Whether you got a product or a service. If somebody hired me a visionary hustle to come and speak, and let's say I show up to the speaking engagement 20 minutes late. <laughs> I'm unprepared. I'm just all out terrible. My act, I walk in like I don't even care. Like, oh yeah, especially they pay me. I'm getting paid. And I don't even care. I'm late. I give off that attitude. Would you hire me again? Exactly. That's why the attitude I carry when I engage with people is that I care. You have to let the customers know that you care about the problem that you're here to solve. And outside problems as well. I also train promotional marketing promotions. Any of you have been to Sam's Club, you might have been walking out and you might see some people standing there saying, are you a homeowner? And they try to get you to buy windows, doors, and I train them. I train them on customer engagement. And teach them empathy. And attitude plays a big part in that. Because even though you're asking them do they have any home service products that they may need, they're not just going to say yes and no, not everybody. 
Some people are gonna say, no, I just can't afford it. My husband or my wife passed away. I'm going through fine, you know. That's where intellect comes in. That's where attitude plays in. You have to have the right attitude to sit there and listen and empathize with what they have going on. Attitude is what keeps your customer. So let's talk about the vision. Vision is what takes your company to the next level. Everybody here that's an entrepreneur that built a company, you built it off a of vision. You say, hey, I want, to, I want to try this. And you thought about it so much that you started writing it down. You started mapping it out. You started building it. There's four stages of entrepreneurship. The first one is excitement. That's an excited stage. You come up with an idea, you're excited. You come up with a logo, you come up with a slogan, you come up with a product or a service, and that's the excitement stage. You get excited until you have to start putting work in. You're like, hey, this ain't gonna go like I thought it was gonna go. You kind of lose that excitement. The next stage is the evolution stage. That's when it goes from the thoughts, that's when it goes from the logo. You, you make everything legit. You get an LLC, you get the city business license, you don't put your logo on the shirt, or on the billboard. You start to evolve. And then you go to the engagement stage. You begin to engage customers and potential customers or clients. Word of mouth. Meeting people. Start telling people, hey, I just started a new company. Sharing it on Facebook. You don't start a Facebook page, you got your work, you got your website. All this is part of the vision. Then you go to the expansion stage. You got consistent customers and clients. Now you're ready to expand and build. Well, how do you do that? Your vision. We see vision every day in business. iPhone. iPhone, what we on? iPhone 10 now? That's their vision. We went from 1 to 10. Jordans. You got like 13 pair of Jordans. They all different. This the vision. Branding, clothing line, and everything else, you see how the vision expands. We have this one vision, but how can we expand? How can we go up? Well, we got our phone. Let's try our phone too. Let's make it this way. Let's add these features. They have to upgrade. All off the vision. So where your business set now, you have a vision for it. That's how I got there. You had a vision for it. Now you have to recreate a vision to where you want to go next, because it's all about building up. So what is your vision next? What's the vision next? If you're stuck, that's what you should ask yourself. Where do I want to go from here? What does next look like for me? And that's the vision. The most important part is the education. Without the education, you're just gonna have a hustle and you just don't know where you're going with the hustle because you're not educated enough to put the vision. So you got to have the education. What is the education coming? What comes with education? Target audience. Who are you targeting? We would like to be able to target everybody with our services, but it, it just doesn't happen like that. <laughs> everybody, you can't target everybody. So you have to break it down. Who's your customer avatar? Sometimes, a lot of times, the target audience and your customer avatar are one and the same. Sometimes they're not, you gotta be able to distinguish the two. Like I work with people on probation and parole. That's my, target, that's my target audience. But they're not able to pay for my service. So my customer avatar are agencies who work with people on probation and parole. Because they can pay for my service, and they also can get me in front of my target audience. So the target audience and your customer avatar can be one and the same, but sometimes they can be different. It's kind of like with baby clothes. You make clothes for babies, that's who you target. Babies don't buy the clothes. So your customers are mothers, parents, because they're the ones that's going to buy them. I'm working one-on-one -on -one with this guy now. He's a tutor, and the, the problem is he's been using his target audience as the customer. And I had to break it down to him, like, you want to get into schools, but 
the stewardess is not going to pay them, even though that's what you told you. The schools are not going to pay you. So the customer avatar should be whoever handles the problem with the schooling. Or if you're doing tutoring outside the school for parents, they're the ones who are going to pay the money. But the education department of even your target audience and your customer avatar is understanding everything about them. You should have a name of a person that you feel like is your target audience. You should have the, you should have a name for them. John Brown, you know, the name John Brown. You should know how much they make a year, what you, you know, how much they make a year, whether they single, whether they married, divorced, how many children they have, what they read, what they watch on TV, their demographic, their hobbies, when they're on the internet, what do they search? So that way you can get a vast understanding and education about who you're targeting. And you know that brings out ways you can reach them. But we're talking about education. Part of the education is understanding your market. Like I said, we all would like the opportunity of which we can target everybody. That would be, that'd be great. It just don't work like that, though. So you got to have a deep education understanding about how you're going to reach the people that you're targeting. How are you going to reach your customers? How are you going to reach potential customers? If I own a ski slope or a skiing place, I wouldn't target the people that I know that this ain't not going to ski. Let's just be honest. I wouldn't target, I wouldn't, I'm just going to be, I'm just a realistic person to be out there. I wouldn't target a lot of African Americans because a lot of African Americans do not ski. This is what it is. Now, that's not a small percentage, but I, well, I'm going to get money to target that area, period. No, I would focus on the area of where my target audience and customers are. And a lot of times in business, the mistakes that we make is we try to reach everybody instead of reaching that, that core, that solid core. Because what comes with that solid core, if you got good business, is the word of mouth. The word of mouth will bring the customers that's interested in what you have, interested in your product, interested in your services. So, so a lot of times we can't focus on those. I know we always want to bring them all in, we just can't do it. We just can't do it. So that's where the education comes in. So we have the hustle, we have the attitude, we have the vision, we have the education. Have. These play a major role in entrepreneurship. The attitude is important, again, because you gotta learn in, in business, <laughs> entrepreneurship, starting out and maintaining, you're gonna take some hits. You're gonna go across some obstacles. You're gonna, it's gonna be a point in time when you're gonna feel like nothing is happening. And you just gonna just want to give up. This ain't worth it. This ain't worth it. This ain't worth it. What I thought it was gonna be. Then you look at the numbers and you see within the first few years how many people who start business fail. And you be like, maybe I just ain't cut for it. But that's where the attitude comes in. When you got to have a positive attitude and say, hey, even though it's not working now, I gotta figure out a way to keep pushing to jump over this hurdle, to make it through this obstacle, and make something happen. I mean, I've been there. When I first started Visionary Hustle, it was like, I instantly thought, that's the disciples thing I was telling you about. Oh, I'm gonna start this business, I'm gonna be speaking everywhere. I'm gonna be all over the place speaking. Phone's gonna be ringing, everybody wants to hear my story. And after about four months, I, <laughs> nobody got in contact with me. <laughs> I didn't have no closing clients. But I didn't let that deter me. I had to get out there. And this is how I found out about the foot in the hustle. This is why I'm like, I got to get out there and hustle, visiting hustle. 
So I started hosting Consciousness and Success Seminars. Put my own money up. Consciousness and Success Seminars. Going out there, networking with people, passing out flyers and everything. Freedom and Success Seminars. And people will come. And there, I will monetize off my freedom. I got five books. I got shirts. So I will sell books, shirts, and coaching package programs at my free event. And so that's how I got over the hump of not getting anything. I had to go get it myself. And sometimes you might have to do that in business. My main thing is today is to let you know you can't sit back and think that the business is going to come to you. If you sit back and think that the business is going to come to you, you don't put that attitude, I mean, you don't put that hustle in there, you don't carry the attitude that I got to make this happen. If you don't have a vision, if you're not educating yourself, you're going to be part of a statistic where you fail within the first few years. So you have to draw up a plan. Okay, what's my next hustle move? How am I going to push my product? How am I going to get people to come to my restaurant? The perfect story of an attitude of the business is this. I was in a coffee shop one time, sitting back, having my coffee. As I'm sitting there having coffee, a guy walks in, he goes to the counter, the owner says, can I help? He says, I like a cup of coffee black, no sugar, no cream, no nothing, and I want a cup on the wall. So I'm sitting there, you know, in the coffee shop's only so big, so you kind of hear everybody's conversation. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, a cup on the wall? I'm like, what the hell? The guy pays for two cups of coffee, he gets one cup of coffee, he leaves. The owner turns around and takes a sticker of a cup of coffee, puts it on the wall. I look up, it's probably like 10 cups of coffee on the wall. So, okay, what's that all about? You know, I never seen that like this. Another customer comes through the door. He's in a rush. Got a business suit on him. Got him must be running late from work. Goes to the counter. He says, yes, I want a cup of coffee and I want a cup on the wall. Well, he wants a cup on the wall too. Pays for two cups of coffee. The guy rushes out. Owner puts another cup of coffee on the wall. About 15 minutes later, I'm still trying to figure out what the cup on the wall is all about. A guy comes in, and I don't want to say he's homeless, but he appears to be homeless. He comes in, on a greets him the same way he greets everybody else, with a smile, embraces him, a warm welcome. So how you doing today? So I'm doing all right. He says, can I help you? He says, yeah, I'd like a cup off the wall. The owner goes up there, grabs a cup off the wall, fixes the man a cup of coffee, guy goes to the booth, Enjoy his coffee, free of charge, cup off the wall. That's the perfect attitude of a business. That alone in that environment brings customers, keeps the customers that they already have, and it makes everyone feel welcome from the top of the food chain to the bottom of the food chain because of that business attitude. Think of the vision that they had to have behind that to say, you know what, how can we give away a cup of coffee at the same time and make money? Because they're doubling their money if everybody coming in is getting a cup of coffee and they get the cup on the wall. So it's more coffee, the more cup on the wall than off the wall. So they make their pop. It's the attitude of the business. And that's what you got to have. Hey, hustle, attitude, business, education. Keys to success. Before I wrap this up, there's one important factor in all businesses that you got to have outside of the keys to success that you should present. And if you can't, just use one word. So I'm gonna give it to you in a story. Everybody always talk about grumpy old men. No offense to all the older generation. <laughs> but you hear about grumpy old men. I got a neighbor the same way. I'm like, you seem like I ask him questions, you just, I irritate him. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting on my porch, he's outside his yard, he's, he's like he's planting something. So I'm curious, I'm just a curious person, I got to figure out what's going on. 
So I go up there and say, hey, hey John, what you, what you plant? He says, I'm planting a fruit tree. I said, well, you answer that kind of aggressive. I just asked him, what was you doing? He said, man, I'm planting a fruit tree. I said, my father, he's like, yeah, what do you want? I said, I'm thinking, he's about 70 years old. So I'm thinking like, okay, if this fruit tree happens to decide to grow and bear its fruit, you want to be alive to enjoy the fruit. This is what I'm thinking. I'm the type of person, what I think comes out. <laughs> I said, man, why are you planting the fruit tree? You ain't even going to be alive once the tree gets big and the fruit, <laughs> and the fruit grows on it. He got, oh, he got hot. He said, see, that's what I'm talking about. See, you come over here all the time following me, man. You think you know everything. You just don't know nothing. I said, what do you mean? He says, you want to know how to run a successful business? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm going to break it down to you. This is what he told me. He said, I'm not planting this fruit tree for myself. I own this house, I own this land. My children was raised in this house. They bring their children by every weekend and come enjoy time with me and my wife. He said, so once I'm gone, they're gonna be able to take over this land. They're gonna have this house. They're gonna be able to come. So when that fruit tree grows, my family is gonna be able to enjoy and reap the benefits of the fruits of my labor. He said, that's what's wrong with you. You're not thinking generation. you trying to enjoy the fruits of your labor and not let others enjoy the fruits of your labor. Then he hit me with this. He said, Helen Walton, you know who that is? I said, no. Nah. He said, that's the wife of Sam Walton. You know who Sam Walton is? I said, okay. He said, she said, it's not about what you gather, but what you scatter that'll tell you what kind of life you have lived. Again, it's not about what you gather, but what you scatter that will tell you the kind of life that you have lived. And he said he implemented that in his business. He did more scattering than gathering. Come on the wall. Thanks a lot for part of that sermon. I say that 
because whether people want to like it or admit it or not, science changes. And it's a lot of cultural integration. And for your business, like for example, you have, in today's society, if you don't have a, a business, or you don't have a, a Hispanic speaking person in there, then what happens when someone comes in and nobody on your staff able to speak Spanish? You lose out on a customer, a potential faithful customer. Potentially not just that customer, but anybody else who's Spanish speaking will not come into your business. I think, and I believe, this is my personal belief, I'm not saying it's true or anything. I believe if you have a business, you should have someone that's trained to speak Spanish. I mean, you don't have to be Hispanic, but you should have someone trained to speak Spanish because that's just the way of the world. When you get on your phone and you call customer service, what they tell you? Press one for what? Press two for what? They adapted to the way of the world. They adapted to what's going on in the world. And that's what it's all about. You have to adapt as a business. You have to adapt to the way of the world. Because if you don't, if your business is stuck in old practice and old ways, it's going it's to end up, it's going to die out. It's going to die all the way out. So, when you go into the drawing board and say, what do we need to change our business? You need to look at the diversity of your business. Look at the diversity of your business. And then go from that point on. Okay, this is what I need. Why do I need this? And when you add that, you add it up, you get a chance to meet someone from a different culture, understanding that culture as well. I had a conversation with a guy yesterday, he was talking about. He's like, well, in my neighborhood, it's, it's, it's a lot of different people. I said, that's good because now, if I go over the neighborhood, let's say I have someone, uh, someone's from, uh, let's say, China in my neighborhood. Let's say I have someone from, uh, let's say I have a Latino in my neighborhood. I got black, I got white, and we all get along. And I go to their house. When you go to someone's house, you see their culture, you see their area. So once I'm invited to their house, I'm starting to learn more about them and their family, their heritage, their culture. And so now, when my children are raised, they are raised in that same environment, they're not going to see any difference. And they're going to raise, be raised with an understanding of their culture, with a knowledge of their culture. That's why I say you have to, if you don't have enough diversity in your workforce, you have to get rid of that. Or you're going to swallow you up. Okay. You know, I'm shocked by that figure, 44%. Um, I someone I know that has a chain, I tell them, oh, you, you're not ready. What do you mean I'm ready? You're not ready. You're not ready. Because when I work with them, I challenge. I challenge their beliefs. I challenge their values. And I challenge their expectations for themselves. Like, you got a belief that it was designed and set up for me to, for this to happen? I challenge that. If, you, if you're not able to get rid of that belief, you're not ready. You ready, you got what we call it in prison terms, you got a lot more bids than we do. You got a few more bids. You got a few more sentences than we need to do before the rest of it. Sometimes it's not happening because it's not happening with me. I get chance after chance. I find myself in jail, in prison, in prison, in prison until they finally get me. Some people come out and they're just not ready to live their life. And I let them know, say, hey, you got a few more bids than you. What you mean, man? Why you want to listen to me? You just, you, I'm just being honest with you. I don't want to give you. Why you say that? Then I break it down. What I see in them will tell me why they have a few more bids. Then I challenge them. Change that. Who do you 
small. Because my job on that level is to not make them successful and be complete probation and parole. It's the success part is never going back. A lot of people complete probation and parole and then they get off and then they all free and then they go back to the salary and they now they're back to prison again. My job is to challenge you. Success to me is never going back. They seem to change. I can tell you I change, but if you don't really know me, then all you got is my word. And I think part of the background check is like you hiring people. Like I really, a lot of companies do this now. They check their Facebook, Instagram, stuff like that because on them social media outlets shows who they really are. Like if you go to my social media right now, you call your sim or Big Man, you're gonna see it. All posts that are mostly like uplifting and me doing work, speaking, positive posts. You know, now if you can check it, let's say seven, eight years ago, it would have been something better. You know, but you really can't do too much screening, but at the end of the day, the screen is not going to really tell you who the person is because people can put up a facade and put up a front about who they are, but only going to last for so long. Then sometimes you got to take the, the collateral damage of it. You know, <coughs> if you, you give a person a shot and they, and they just don't turn out to be who they are and then something bad happens, you can't really fault yourself because you're only going off of who they presented themselves to be. You don't know them really. You can't look on the inside and say, oh, this is really who you are. You just have to take a chance. You know, and you'll beat yourself up because you like, up, but the reality is you want to get going on presentations. You know, it's like if you get a, so a presentation in business or something, it, it's, it's just so good when you realize you get in what I thought it was. This phone just ain't what I thought it was, but I don't want it anymore. You just need to repeat the presentation. You know, because you'll never know what a person or what a person has that they gone past you or if it's still in them. Just by one thing about criminals, criminals are clever. They know the answers to give. They know how to carry themselves. But they only can do it for so long. The real you is going to come out and give you one. 
hands off. Zero humor. 